I was saying, I'm going to be preaching on a message you don't hear too often today. Not too many preachers will preach on hell. Uh, it doesn't. It's not a message that people like to hear. And it, but it's a message that people need to hear. And uh, one of the, the warnings that the Lord Jesus warns us about in the Scripture is not so much for those that are lost and know it, but those that think they're saved. And so. Uh, as we get started, we're coming to you this morning from Doers of the Word Baptist Church at 14781 Sperry Road in Newberry, Ohio, 44065. I'm Pastor Ernie Sanders, and the title of the message this morning is The Horrible Realities of the Terrors of Hell. And you're listening to us this morning on 104.3, that's the Liberty Works Radio Network. The Eagle 104.3 in Tampa and Ocala. And we start today in Psalm chapter 2. We read here, now, why do the heathen rage and why do people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their courts from us. Well, that word heathen right there is interchangeable. It's the same word used for nations also. In other words, the lost nations, the unsaved nations. And when he says, let us break their bands, he's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ and his, his followers, or God and the people that follow God and believe in God. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his, his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Well, again, when he's talking about, they're going back, when he says, and, and the rulers take counsel, he's referring not just to the political rulers or the military rulers, but to those also in business, corporate rulers or the judicial rulers, and especially those uh, religious rulers out there today. And he said, he's, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Well, today we see that God has got the opposition in derision. They are in, in total derision. <coughs> They're absolutely clueless to what is going on. <coughs> and then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the hither for thine inheritance, and the other most parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. <coughs> well, we see this exactly happening today, all around us there. We have, especially the young people, but the, the masses are in delusion. People thinking that they can defeat God. It's an interesting thing. And it's, the irony is this. Uh, you hear these people talking about, first of all, in one breath, they'll say there is no God. But then, in the next breath, they'll say, well, one of these days, I'm going to tell God just what I think. Uh, so, again, you see how, how many people are delusional today. If you go to Psalm chapter 9, and I want to read you uh, verse 17. Well, let me start with verse 5. In Psalm 9, Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put their name, put up their name forever and ever. That means blotted out their name forever and ever. And then verse 17 says this, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Well, what is he referring to the wicked? Those that openly mock God uh, today. When, when you take a look at Hillary, 
Bernie Sanders for one, Bill Maher is another, George Soros, and all of the Hollywood whores out there, they mock God. Uh, little Chrissy Matthews, unbelievable. But then there are those that are even worse. They're more subtle. They pretend to be religious people. And they mock God in a different way. You have, you have people uh, like Al Sharpton, who's supposed to be a reverend, mm. or a Jesse Jackson on these people, or uh, so many apostates that have, that have come out professing to be Christians. Barry, Barry Lynn, who professes to be an ordained minister. Well, he might be, but he's in the United Church of the Antichrist. And so these people are even worse, uh, because uh, as we go through here, we're going to see that there are many different degrees of punishment in hell. Oh, yeah. And here to think about the horrors of hell, folks, uh, when we try to think about it, in this, you know, beyond our ability to try to even understand something that never ceases to exist, something that is continual forever and ever and ever. And when we talk about eternal hell fire, that means it never, it never ceases. And see, with us, we, we don't live in a concept where something is not going to end someday. Everything has a beginning and end. But that torment in hell, just like the glory in heaven, will never end. It will never end. And if you go over to you know when I'm out there preaching at these bloody abortion mills on the sidewalk I often I will hear I'll encounter a fool and the fool uh, usually in his guilt and shame often bark out something like why don't you get a real job how many times have you guys heard that? Why don't you get a real job, all of us, okay? Well, then I always reply, I'm an ordained minister, and my job is to preach repentance to the heathen and the fool. You are the heathen and the fool, and your job is to listen to me. And if you don't do that, you're going to make God mad at you, okay? And, see, you know, they're, they're usually, <laughs> often... They think that this is an original saying, that they're the first one to tell you to get a real job, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, if you turn over to Proverbs chapter 8, in Proverbs chapter 8, we read starting in verse 32. Now therefore hearken unto me, O you children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor with the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Wow. And you know it's an interesting thing, because what do they, when they come to the bloody abortion mills, what do they come there for? Death. It's death. And so, here, when we read that verse 35, that's a very clear reference to the Lord Jesus himself. <coughs> and what is death? What is death? The, the actual definition of death in the spiritual realm is separation from God. Eternal separation from God. One time, I, I remember this one particularly, we had a very obnoxious uh, whore came into the abortion mill, and I say that by the things that were, the sewer that was coming out of her mouth, and she screamed out to me, there are no whores, there is no God, and there is no hell. And I told her, I said, well, uh, actually there's more whores than there's ever been, and uh, yes, there is a God, he's alive and well, he's still on the throne, and hell awaits you. <laughs> And see, that's a reality. Now, they don't like to hear these things, but you see, our job is, is not to, to preach what people want to hear. And that's what the prosperity preachers preach. 
Our job is to preach what people need to hear. Amen. You see, now, when you preach to people what they need to hear, you end up finding yourself in a lion's den or being sawed in half, often in the old days. And today, uh, as likely as not, with a very, very corrupt judicial system, uh, people that do that, that preach what they need to hear, often end up in jail or prison. Okay? And, and, of course, throughout the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, uh, just uh, a week ago, well, last Friday, they, uh, they crucified a Catholic priest, ISIS did. Uh, but that didn't hardly make any, any news at all, hardly any news coverage. What made the news coverage uh, was Donald Trump and uh, making women mad at him. And, you know, what Trump said before he, he backed away, you know, if he had the integrity to stand on what he said, what he said was true. When they asked him if women should be punished for having an abortion, yeah, see, abortion is murder. And if they were punished for having, listen, in this country, up until 1973, they were punished. They went to prison for killing their children. The Bible says that not only is it a crime, but it's a horrible offense against God. And Trump should have stood on that, but he didn't. He, he let Prissy Chrissy Matthews back him down right away like he's done in so many other things. Folks. Now you say, you mean to tell me that all these women that have abortion should be punished? No, not all of them. Some of these young girls are drug in there against their will and forced. They... Uh, they need to have a lawsuit against those that, that brought him in. Like Jesus said right. to Pontius Pilate, he said that those that delivered me to you, their sin is the greater. He didn't tell Pilate that he didn't have a sin. Right. He just said that there's a greater sin on those that delivered me, them to me. Amen. And uh, those that force uh, those young women killing their child, well, they're the victim. The woman is the victim, too, not just the baby. Mm. Okay. But anyhow, I want you to go over to uh, Luke, or to Hebrews chapter 10, in fact. And in Hebrews chapter 10, I want to read verses 30 through 39. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call the remembrance the former days in the which after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of afflictions, partially while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and affliction. And partially why you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast out away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And he's referring to those that aren't really saved, those that have a profession of faith, those that, yeah, They'll tell you, and that's the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. Today, the Philippines of the churches, and <coughs> this is spoken over and over and over again in the media, uh, or in the Bible. And what happens today, uh, the message would be that there's no time to let the media, let Hollywood, let the rest of the Antichrist world system one, put doubt in your mind and fear in your mind. Uh, don't let them keep you from the rewards you've placed up in heaven by drawing back. It's interesting, today they, they call it walking it back, walking it back. In other words, you say one thing and then all of a sudden you change. 
A double-minded man is unstable in how many of his ways? All of his ways. All of his ways. And boy, it seems like that's what we have more and more of today out there. And so, if you go over to Luke, and in Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read you verses 1 through 5. In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch they took and trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware you of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be rewarded or revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in clouds it shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. So Amen. the reason that, that most pastors today won't preach on hell is because uh, it frightens people. And it does it, like Joel Osteen says, put money in the offering plate. Huh. And now the reason that I preach on hell is to put the, the fear of God into not only those that don't believe, but to those that think that they're saved and are not. Amen. And that's the majority. There's so many out there today. And those are the hardest people to witness to, folks. They are. People think that they're saved or they're Christians. Somebody assured them that, and somebody told them what they wanted to hear. They didn't go to the Bible. They didn't read uh, from the manual here. They let someone tell them what they wanted to hear, so they walk around with a false sense mm. of security. And boy, are they in for a rude awakening. I think one of the one of the things that uh, the only thing could be worse than going to hell is to be in hell with people that you gave that false sense of security to. Ooh, yeah. And so, if you turn over to Matthew chapter seven, and we start in verse thirteen. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there. This is where you've got the word Broadway. This is where those songs and everything about Broadway, mm -hmm. Hollywood, the entertainment. And you see, that's where people go. They, they want to be on the Broadway. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth into life. And few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, the pastors that are preaching the gospel out there, the ones that are staying to the word of God, they are the ones that are going to be villainized in the media. By the time I'm finished preaching this message, we'll probably be hearing from moveon.org again. Because okay? uh, uh, they're not going to like this message, this message on hell. And so many of them out there today. You have all of these false preachers like you know, Rick Warren, you know, reminds you when, when Rick Warren first came on the scene with his Purpose Living Drug life book, I went out and I was trying to warn people, and pastors, so many of the pastors, many of them, if I mentioned their name, you folks would know who they are. They fell into that. They fell into that. They didn't realize it. They, they just took the hook, line, and sinker. And then what finally, what finally woke them up a little bit, 
Well, when Rick Warren finally went into Krizlam, uh, some of them said, you know, uh, maybe old Pastor Sanders had it right. This guy's, uh, he's not on the up and up. <laughs> no, no, folks. But you see, it's, it's the very same thing like liberation theology. You know, liberation theology is the marrying or the mixing together of the teachings of Karl Marx and Jesus Christ. They're, they're in total opposition one to another. And Islam and Christianity is in a total opposition to one to another. And so when these preachers come out, and one of the things that the apostate preachers were saying was that if God's not in it, why is he prospering it? Now think about that for a minute. Does God allow evil things to prosper? Folks? How about how about Hollywood? How about the pornography trade? How about the, uh, you know who was it? Al Sharpton didn't pay five million dollars worth of back taxes. They didn't go after him, did they? Yeah, God allows wicked, the evil to prosper. Why? Well, He says that He allows them. A little pleasure for a short season. That's as good as it's going to get for them. Because once they leave this world, folks, okay, it's downhill. Everything goes soft for a long, long time. He goes on to say, Not everyone to say then to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But here you go. This is very simple. These are the people that are going to heaven. These are the people right now that are going to heaven, folks. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now listen, let me tell you something. In order to do the works of the Father, in order to do the works of the Father, you have to know what the works of the Father are. And if you don't study the Word of God, if you don't know the Word of God, you're not going to do the works of the Father. And folks, if you think it's enough to come and, and just sit here and listen to me preach an hour on Sunday morning, I mean, you're deceiving yourself. It's not. God tells you that you're to be in His Word. It's the greatest source of knowledge in the world. So all I can do is tell you what you need to do. You have to do it. Because one thing is absolutely for sure. Well, everything in the Word of God is absolutely for sure. But you'll either do that, you'll either study the Word of God to be approved, or you'll wish you had. That's, what's, that's the way it is. You'll either study the Word of God to find yourself approved, or the time will come and you surely, surely will wish that you had. And so... There's a reason that hell is necessary, and you find it over in Habakkuk chapter 1. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Art thou then not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art a pure... Now listen to this first. Listen to this first, because it really says a whole lot. Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Here's what it's saying there in these two verses. One. If you remember when the Lord Jesus was upon the cross and he had taken the sins of the world upon him, God caused utter darkness <coughs> to fall upon the earth. He took away so he didn't have to look upon that, mm -hmm. that sins upon him. But what is he saying here? He's saying here that God will often, when he judges the wicked, judge them but those that are even more wicked. Boy, do we see that, don't we, with the wars with Islam. 
And make us men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take of all of them with the angel. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice into their net and burn incense into their drag. Because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations. And he's talking about <coughs> those that are powerful and conquering that God will use. Uh, as he has. And, and as we talked about before, how I reminded, I, I was reminded by so many different people, and all of them I think thought that they were the first ones to tell me that when it came to this election and, and Donald Trump, that God will often use unsaved people and he will often use wicked people uh, to punish their enemy, his enemies. Well, that's true. And so they, they're telling me that to justify voting for someone. But you see, in God's word, the Bible, as we preached here several times, God makes it very specific who we're to vote for. He makes it very specific in his word that we are to vote for other Christians. Okay? And uh, so, while they're saying trying to justify this or that. Um, they're finding themselves at odds with God's word. Anytime you find yourself at odds with God, who loses? You do. Yeah. So he says, I want you to turn over to Matthew 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, starting with verse 41, we read this. <clears throat> then shall they say also unto them on the left hand do you ever notice that everything that those on the left always refers to the wicked and the evil and uh, those on the right always refers to the righteous uh, depart from me you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for I was a hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer and say, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Well, going back to verse 41, when he says, And to everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, there's a difference between hell, <coughs> Hades, Guiana and the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. They're all literal. Hell is literal. But it's not a literal place. It's a state of being. It's torment. Hell is torment. The lake of fire is a literal physical place. Now who's he talking about here? Well, God's people. When you've done it to the least of mine. Who's the least of mine? Well, starting off with a child in the womb. A babe in the womb. And then those that are helpless, people that can't help themselves. Little children. Prison inmates. He tells you right here. Those in prison. We have a whole lot of Christian people in prison in this country, and it's going to get a whole lot worse. And there's supposed to be a whole lot of people should be visiting them that aren't. Remember, when Scripture says, be you doers of the word, not just hearers only. Again, it's going to work out this way. You'll either, you'll either take that to heart. You'll either place up crowns of glory. You'll either do as what it says here, minister to those people in prison or to the sick. Uh, Feed the hungry. That's what we're to do. Amen. The church is to do that, not government. Right. 
Government messes up everything it touches. As Ronald Reagan, Reagan often said, government is not the answer, it is the problem. And then, when we talk about hell, what you say? When you everlasting fire, everlasting fire. What is that fire? Well, the answer is in Hebrews chapter 12. If you go to Hebrews chapter 12, and in verses 25 through 29, you find out that God himself is the fires of hell. The thing that cannot be shaken, God's kingdom, his salvation, his words, and to those that do God's will. Starting in verse 25, we read this. See that you refuse not him that speaketh? For if they escaped not who refused him, that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken away remain. Remember, wherefore we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly <coughs> fear. For our God is a consuming fire. God is the fires of hell. And what is he talking about? The things that cannot be shaken. God's kingdom. His salvation. His words. And those that do God's will. And then I want you to go back over to Luke chapter 16. In verses 19 through 26. And if we read here, you have to realize that Hades is where the spirits of the lost will be held unto the white throne judgment. And we start in verse 19. There was a certain rich man. And by the way, the rich man's name was Divus, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now remember this here, Hades is only uh, until the white throne judgment. Hades is a place of torment, but it's not the great torment that's in the white throne judgment. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said Lazarus that he may dip the dip of his finger in, in water and, and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. See, that flame is very real and it's forever. It's forever. You see, when, when, when you're in a situation where when you're in pain and agony, in most of all, every situation, we look to some end, even if that end means that we die and we're no longer in our pain. Not in this case. It's forever. Forever. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. And boy, if that's not true, folks. For 2,000 years, we've been, so we've been commemorating and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> the 
And for 2,000 years, people have been hearing the gospel being preached. And only a very small percentage have been receiving it. And then in Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 50. Now, you got to notice something here in this passage of Scripture, Mark 9, 42 through 50. The worm that never dieth, the worm that never dieth, and the fire that's not quenchable is mentioned it three times. He really puts an emphasis on this. And whosoever shall, now these are the words of the Lord himself. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. A millstone weighed 4,000 pounds. Now, it, it, it's really rough to swim with 4,000 pounds around your neck. He's making a real good, good point here. If they had offend thee, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. <coughs> when I was in the service, I got malaria. And when I had malaria, I was way out in the jungle. And out in the jungle, they had a, a jungle compound. It was uh, it was about the size of this building, but it was like three stories high. It didn't have any glass windows, only screens. And it was way out in the middle of no place, but it was the military. It was the U.S. Army. Of course, all the military. And But whatever, they would also help in the natives out there that needed help come there. And that's where I was, out in that area, and that was the closest place because I had a really bad case of malaria. In fact, the doctor said it was the worst case he'd ever seen, ever. Mm -hmm. And anyhow, I said all that to say this. There was one other. Up there, They uh, why they put us all the way up on the top floor, I don't know, but they there was just two of us in there, and all of those beds up there, and the whole place, the just myself and one other fellow. And this fella had a case of worms, and it was worms that no one had ever seen before. He, he had gotten them, he thought, by sitting on a stump out in the jungle. But these worms would eat him. And uh, he, would, he would there, they would go up his legs, and uh, he would have, you could see, it was like a road map, they, where they would, they would go, they would eat under the skin, and they would leave red lines, and then when they would stop and lay their eggs, it would be like a little circle there. Okay. And when they were eating him, he was in awful pain. Okay. As they were moving, they would move together. And he, he begged me, uh, now this may sound crazy, but he actually begged me. He wanted me to, well, the only thing that would stop these worms at any, is they would give him uh, warm beer to drink. And if he sweat a whole lot, if he sweat a lot, the worms would stop moving, and they quit eating. And they tried electric shock; that didn't work. They tried actually freezing. Uh, most of these were in his back and his, his backside, and that didn't work. And so he comes up with this idea, and I'm in there, not feeling real good anyhow. Uh, and I've got this guy all day long begging me. This idea he has was he wanted me to pour lighter fluid in his behind. Light it up and then beat it out real quick with a pellet. His, his theory was that once they have that, that, that would that would cause the worms to stop. I, said, I, I can't do that. I can't. You know, what if I don't get a beat up? Well, finally, I, he wore me down. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm in there with him 24 hours a day for uh, a week, and uh, I couldn't take it. So, you know, I put the lighter fluid on him. I got my pillow ready. I lit him. And wouldn't you know? Right at that time. The medics that never show up up there happen to go walk in. So they come in and they see uh, this guy with a flaming butt and me putting it up with a pistol. And so 
<laughs> they took me down to the doctor, and this guy was, uh, he was the same one that told me I was the worst case malaria he ever saw. He says, you know, he says, he's U.S. military property. You, you were setting proper U.S. military I said, look, you know, I couldn't take this guy anymore. I'm not feeling good. Things are not good. Well, anyhow, uh, this guy's as much pain as he was come down, and he, he convinced him, look, he said he didn't want to do it. I, I begged him. I begged him. It's my fault, not his. So they dropped charges, but I could have been court-martialed for something like that. But anyhow, the reason I said all that was when those worms were eating him, he was in such pain. I mean, such pain and agony. Okay, and you know, up until you know, I I never really thought that much in this passage of scripture about worms that would never die until I saw him and listened to him. And and uh, you know, here's a guy that would moan and cry, and, uh, and it was way past the time he should have been out of the military. But they had no cure, so they, they sent him to Walter Reed, and I don't know whatever happened to him. I never. He, I lost contact. But anyhow, let me go back to this. He said, Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, and to a fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, and if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes, and to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt had lost its saltiness, wherewith you have seasoned it, have salt in yourselves, and have peace with one another. And so I want you to turn over to... <coughs> I did Mark 9? Go to Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 to 15. Now, the punishment for the religious leaders is going to be the greater. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. When he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Folks, I'm going to tell you, this is why he, he uses that word damnation. That's a stronger uh, connotation than condemnation. So he's making a very, their punishment will be the greater, the greater. And then in Isaiah chapter 66, I want to read this, verses 22 through 24. And here, now the saints will look upon the liberals in their torment, uh, but that memory won't last with us very long. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now he's talking about us. We're going to get a, a glimpse, a look at those that are going to be tormented to the flames of hell. But it won't be for long, because if you turn right over to chapter 65 and you read verse 17, we read, For behold, I create new heaven and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come to mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever, 
that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard, and heard nor the voice of crying. I'm going to stop there and, then, and finish it, sign off here. You've been listening to us this morning on the Liberty Works Radio Network. That's the Eagle 104.3 FM in Tampa and Ocala. Uh, you can hear this program relayed on Sunday, replayed on Sunday from 2 a.m., 8 a.m., 3 p.m., and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you'd like to call us, our phone number is 440-338-1367. Until next week, we want to say good morning, God bless, and remember always, always, keep fighting the fight. Okay, I want to go over now to Isaiah 33. In Isaiah 33, uh, remember the chaff and the stubble are what we would call politically correctness. Uh, and uh, their evil works. In Isaiah 33, verses 10 through 17. Now will I rise, saith the Lord, now will I exalt, now will I lift up myself. You shall conceive chaff, and you shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be as the burning of lime, as thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. Hear you that are far off what I have done, that you might that you are near. Acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell in the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell in the everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he hath despised the gain of oppressions and shaken his hands from holding of bribes, to stopping his ears from the hearing of the blood and shutting his eyes from seeing evil. That means they've kept their integrity, those that have not compromised, and like so many today that are selling out in every area. Today when you, you sell out and you call it, and you compromise, they call it walking it back. It's just the, the expression they use now. He shall dwell on high, his place of defiance shall be the mountains of rocks, and bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. And then I want to end by going to, well, first I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 4. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on his behalf. You know, folks, it's going to make the world is going to tell you there's something wrong with you, you religious fanatic, you superstitious fool. They're going to tell you that. But again, don't compromise. Stand your ground. Don't be like the politicians do today. To go this way and go that way. <coughs> the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, the church has been judged for the last 2,000 years. God's been judging the church. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, that should cause shivers run down your spine. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. You see, he uses the word doing, doing, doing. Be you doers of the word, not just hearers only. As unto a faithful creator. And then I want to finish in Revelation chapter 22. And these verses here, I want you to, verses 1 through 5, we are going to be eating from the tree of life forever. There's going to be no more death, 
no more pain, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more political correctness, no more IRS, no more EPA, NEA. There will be no liberalism. And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of, of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither the light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And that's the end of that. And uh, I think today, don't we have the Lord's table today? Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to take the Lord's table.